We are in the book of Lamentations, chapter 2 today. This book seems to have been written by Jeremiah, the year that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. That would be 587 B.C. And it is a sad song that recounts Judah bringing this judgment upon themselves and the need for confession and repentance. So Lamentations chapter number two says this, How he who is in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He's cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He's not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. So it begins with this idea of how how far down Judah has fallen. The daughter of Zion has fallen. So much so that God is not even thinking about how he used to describe this city of Jerusalem as his footstool, the place where he put his feet on planet Earth. The relationship had been ruptured. And so that's why judgment followed. Verse 2, He who is has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he's broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He's brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. So everything's been pulled down. Uh, All of the strong places, all the fortified cities, they're done They're finished. The kingdom is over. And the rulers are either dead or on their way to exile. Verse 3, he has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He's withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. Now, the promise under the covenant was that As long as they were living by the covenant, no enemy could defeat them. But if they violated the covenant to the point where God felt they were no longer living in good faith relationship with him, God would withdraw that promised protection. And that's exactly what's happened here to allow the city and the temple to be destroyed. He's bent his bow like an enemy with his right hand set like a foe. He's killed all who were delightful in our eyes in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. So fire represents judgment. So we keep seeing fire mentioned throughout this and other books. Uh, But God is basically the one that's attacked Judah. Yes, the Babylonians are the ones that he's using to do this, but it's actually God that's calling the shots. Verse 5, the Lord, or he who is, has become like an enemy. He's swallowed up Israel. He's swallowed up its palaces. He's laid in ruins its strongholds. He's multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. So there's crying everywhere because of the Lord's intervention in judgment. Uh, He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. Now, these are poetic references to the sanctuary. Uh, His booth would bring into mind the tabernacle of old, and the tabernacle was replaced by the temple. Uh, The meeting place is another name for the temple and the tabernacle. It's where the people gather together to meet with God. So he, God himself, has destroyed the temple complex. He who is has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. So the country has ended. The people have gone into exile. There will be no festivals at the temple for 70 years. Uh, The Sabbaths are not going to be kept here uh, any longer. Those that go into exile may find they have no choice but to work on the Sabbath day if they are a slave or have a job uh, in the the, uh, 
in the Gentile economy. Uh, they will also uh, be unable to uh, keep the festivals with any type of celebration because they are far, far away from a ruined temple complex. And God has also taken down the kingdom. There are no kings anymore. Uh, and the priests, there's no temple for the priests to work in. So the priests are redundant, just like a king is redundant when there is no kingdom, no palace. Verse 7, he who is has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He's delivered into the hands of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They raised a clamor in the house of he who is as on the day of festival. So there's lots of noise that went on in the Temple Mount, uh, in the, uh, the shrine complex, but it was all about war, not about celebration. Uh, God's given all of those sacred places over to the enemy. Uh, verse 8, uh, He who is determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion, he stretched out a measuring line. He didn't restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. So the physical structure of Jerusalem, God takes down. Verse 9, Her gates have sunk into the ground. That is, they've disintegrated. Uh, the stone part of them have been pulled down and taken apart. The wood portion of the gate itself probably burned to ashes. Uh, he has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from he who is. So the royal family, what remains of it, is gone out of the nation, out of the kingdom. Uh, they are living up in Babylonia somewhere. Uh, the law is no more in force because Israel's not in the land. And her prophets, her so-called prophets, they're not getting visions from God. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They've thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. So the elders that used to sit in the gates and offer uh, judgments and advice as the respected leaders of their community, those guys are all in mourning now. And so are the young women. They have got their faces on the ground, in the dirt. Verse 11. My eyes are spent with weeping, my stomach churns, my bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. Now, we would be tempted to think that this is Jeremiah that's expressing his own feelings at this point, but it is still couched, apparently, as the words of a personified Jerusalem or Judea, that the, the representation of the country is grieving, lamenting the fate of those that used to live inside of her. Uh, and the babies are crying for hunger and for mom. Uh, verse 12, they cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine as they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom? So the little kids are like, Mommy, 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 where's our food? I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I don't want to go anywhere else. Things like that. And nothing can be done about it. Verse 13, what can I say to you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? So there is an expression of regret and uncertainty. How, how am I supposed to relate to this situation that's happened to Zion, to Jerusalem? Because... It's like being caught up in an ocean of anguish. 
Verse 14, your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They've not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. Now, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel have complained about this on behalf of the Lord, that the people kept listening to the false preachers, the false teachers that kept telling them, oh, everything will be fine. God's okay with you. Uh, he's not mad. Uh, you're, you're okay just the way you are. Because that didn't help. The people needed to be called to account for their sin. And these prophets were not doing that. And that's what brought absolute disaster upon this culture, is that they had too many false leaders affirming them in their sinfulness instead of being uh, those that would call them to repentance. Verse 15, all who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? So the ruins, just piles of ash and scattered stones. Uh, that's all that's left of Jerusalem. People are going to be coming by there for the next several generations, and they're going to be like, oh, wow, I never expected that this is what the great city of Jerusalem would look like right now. Uh, it used to be so beautiful. It used to be the centerpiece of the earth. What happened? Verse number 16, all your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth, they cry, we've swallowed her. Ah, oh, this is the day we long for. Now we've seen it. We see it. And so uh, even those living nearby in other countries are copping an attitude against Jerusalem now that it's gone. Uh, they are happy about it. Now that's going to get them in trouble. We know that. Uh, but they're doing it nonetheless. Verse 17, he who is has done what he purposed. He's carried out his word. So something I often say about God, he always keeps his promises and his threats. And so the threat of condemnation, the threat of judgment has been passed on through prophets for a long time now. And now he's carried it out, which he commanded long ago, He's thrown down without pity. He's made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to he who is, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. So cry, cry, cry. You need to cry in repentance for what brought along this judgment. Arise, cry out in the night, at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of he who is. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. So pray for your family members, pray for your little kids, because they're caught up in the judgment that has come because of unrepentant sin. Verse 20, look, O he who is, and see with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of he who is? So should this be the norm? Cannibalism? Moms and dads eating their babies because they're so hungry? Uh, should it be the norm that when you go up to the Temple Mount, there's dead bodies of priests and prophets all over the place? Now, now, that's a rhetorical question that should be answered in the negative. But because there was not repentance, that is exactly what we're going to have to see. Verse 21, in the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. So no age discrimination in war. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. So no gender discrimination in war. You've killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. 
you summoned as if to a festival day. All my terrors on every side and on the day of the anger of he who is, no one escaped or survived, those whom I held and raised my father, uh, my enemy destroyed. So God has brought about this desolation of the land, of the city, of the temple because of sin. He's gathered the people together not to one of his mandatory festivals, but to his mandatory judgment. Chapter number three now. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. So here is God's judgment on the nation, upon the people of Judah. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He's broken my bones. He's besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulations. He's made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. So everything is bad. Everything is turned horrible. He's walled me about so that I cannot escape. He's made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He's made my paths crooked. Uh, this prayer thing, you might remember that Ezekiel, up in the area of Babylonia, uh, he spent time on his side with the uh, a diorama of the siege of Jerusalem in front of him on a clay tablet. Uh, he was laying on his side, but he had a metal wall that he had to put up between himself and the city to represent that God was not going to respond to prayers for mercy and compassion. He was done with that. Judgment was the guaranteed response. So we see that here again. Nothing that anyone could have done other than genuine repentance could have stopped the coming of God's judgment at this time. Verse 10, he is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He's made me desolate. So God's been like a wild animal in his judgment. He bent his bow and sent, set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. So God's like a hunter that was hunting down the nation in judgment. Verse 14, I've become the laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He's filled me with bitterness. He's sated me with wormwood. Wormwood is a bitter tasting uh, uh, element. And so God has put the bitterness of judgment on these people. Verse 16, he's made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. Uh, if you could imagine having gravel stuffed into your mouth, uh, that's how it feels to come under the judgment of God. Uh, to take yourself uh, out of a pleasant situation and throw yourself into an ash heap. That's what it feels like. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. See, it's been so long now under God's judgment, just a few years since the uh, siege started, that the people in Jerusalem have forgotten what it was like to have a good, peaceful day, to have a happy day. So I say my endurance has perished, so has my hope from he who is. Now, they could have at any moment repented and things would have been better, but they didn't. So that's why this is such a sad song that we're having to have Jeremiah sing here. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. Again, bitterness. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Now, nice transition verse here. In the midst of all this judgment, he still has hope because God's put it out there. You've seen, as we've gone through many of these prophecies of destruction, God keeps putting little hints of hope and joy in place. 
Well, here we grab a hold of that. This I call to mind, therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of he who is never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love, that's chesed. It's the idea that God really likes us. He wants a relationship with us. He made us in his image and his likeness at the beginning of creation. And even when sin came in and disrupted that relationship, God still wanted it back. He never gave up on that. And his mercies are not going to quit until everyone has had the chance to make up their mind clearly. Are they or are they not going to have an eternal relationship with him? So his mercies, his steadfast love, they're new every morning. Every day that the sun comes up is a fresh start. Great is his faithfulness. He can be trusted. He who is, is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. He who is, is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Uh, We are reminded that God expects to be looked for. That faith uh, is paid off by the fact that we are diligently seeking him. Verse 26, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of he who is. Now, those of you that have been my students for any time whatsoever, I'm guessing you know what comes next. We have here the Hebrew word for salvation, shua, in close proximity to the divine name, the shortened form of which is yah. Put those two together, yahshua, you have the name of Jesus he who is salvation. So it is good to wait for Jesus. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. So it's good to get things straight younger, to don't go into your old age before you repent. Get your act together as soon as possible. Verse 28, let him sit alone in silence When it is laid on him, let him put his mouth in the dust, that is, go face down. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insults. It is much better to be rebuked hard and repent than to not be rebuked at all and remain in sin. For he who is will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief... He will have compassion according to the abundance of his chesed, his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. You remember this from other passages. God does not take joy or satisfaction in judgment. It does not make him happy that he has to send anyone to hell. He would have everyone to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 34, to crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth, to deny a man justice in the presence of the Most High, to subvert a man in his lawsuit, he who is does not approve. So these are things that God does not go along with. He doesn't like to see prisoners crushed underfoot. He doesn't like to see people denied their justice. He doesn't like to see people subvert the law by using loopholes and twists. He doesn't like any of that. And that was going on in the society which brought about the judgment of Judah and Israel, for that matter. And God is not happy when he sees it happening in our society. Verse 37, who has spoken and it came to pass unless he who is has commanded it? See, he's the only one that can speak the future. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Yes, that's true. God keeps both his promises and his threats. Why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? If God is doing it, it is fair. Let us test and examine our ways and return to he who is. Let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled 
and you have not forgiven. So we need to confess the fact we're the problem. Our sins are the trigger for God's judgment. And the solution is repentance. Change the way we think, which will change the way we act, and will allow us to come back into right relationship with the one who was, is, and will always be the God of the universe. Verse 43, you've wrapped yourself with anger and pursued us, killing without pity. You've wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. There it is again. When God has made this this judgment final, there is no prayer that can change that. You have made us scum and garbage among the peoples. All our enemies open their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall have come upon us. Devastation and destruction. My eyes flow with rivers of tears because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Now, we keep seeing this as kind of the personification of Judah crying over the people, but I am sure that Jeremiah is doing his part in crying too. My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite, until the Lord...